What is up you guys? Welcome to a lecture in numerical analysis and methods called the fixed point method. In this lecture, we're going to attempt a ex very simple explanation on what this method is and how it works. We're going to be learning fixed point method through, a, through one example and see the different functions we can derive from it, the different G functions, okay? And finally, we're going to be stating a theorem and telling you what you need to know from this theorem to guarantee conversions. And last but not least, everything we explained, we're going to apply it on MATLAB to verify conversions according to this theorem. So without further ado, let's get started. Right, so let's talk about fixed point method. So what does this method do? All it does is find the roots of the following equation, f of x equal to zero. Now, one might ask, oh, okay, well, we have a bunch of methods in doing that. Um, for example, if I'm given, uh, I don't know, f of x is equal to x squared minus x minus two, and I'm asked to, you know, just get the roots of this equation. Well, I can use something like um, the discriminant method where I just simply, you know, compute a delta that is b squared minus 4ac where a, b, and c are the coefficients that define my f of x, which is written in the following form, ax squared plus bx plus c, right? So I go ahead and do the math. Delta is 1 minus 4, 1 times minus 2, which is 9, positive. And so I can conclude that I have two real roots, right? that are given to me as such. So the first one is x0, which is minus b, minus square root of delta over 2a. Okay, that is 1 minus square root of 9, which is 3 over 2, right? Which is minus 1. This is one root. And another one is x1, that is minus b plus square root of delta over 2a, that is um again one plus three over two which is two right okay so this is one method acceptable and it, and it works all the time right however a machine or a computer is going to have a hard time doing all this and when i mean hard times that you know it's going to first compute a delta and based off the delta or see if it's positive negative or zero i'm not saying it's not doable it is doable but you know We've got a square root over here. We've got a division and that's, you know, not computer friendly. <laughs> so instead computers prefer something that is iterative, right? So methods such as xn plus one is equal to gx of n. And you just repeat that over and over again till you converge with a certain tolerance or a certain error, right? Um, okay. So one method, one iterative method in achieving the roots, whether this or this, is by finding a suitable G that is able to converge. And this is one part of the fixed point method. The first, the, the first procedure is to find such a G. Well, usually it's not that hard to find a G and most of the time there's many G's that we can you know, choose. Um, let me show you what I mean. So for the example I just gave, that is f of x is x squared minus x minus two, we can come up with many g's. So the first one I could think of, which is pretty straightforward, is that when you write x squared minus x minus two is equal to zero, all I have to do is just manipulate this equation in a way that says x is equal to something. So the most straightforward way is to get your x over here. And so you end up with something like this. So x squared minus two is equal to x. And there you go, that's it. So one, so one g, I'll call it g1 of x, is x squared minus two, as simple as that. Well, but you know, in math, we like to be, we, we're open to options. <laughs> We'd like to explore as many possibilities as we have in hand. So why not also choose another g, for example, I could go ahead and write my equation that I'm trying to solve, that is x squared minus x minus two is equal to zero. As such, x squared is equal to x plus two, right? 
and I could applying a square root on both sides I get a plus or a minus x plus 2 and here you can you know here we've got two G's and this is really based off we're going to talk about this in the in the coming section um, is my G good enough so in this particular case if I choose the plus square root x plus 2 I'm going to converge and we'll see the convert we'll see the conditions of convergence later in a while um, to this one if I choose the if I choose plus square root x plus 2 I'll converge to the positive solution and if I choose minus square root x plus 2 I'll converge to this solution so let's say just for you know if we're concerned with the positive root just for sake of argument I'll pick my square root x plus 2 this is another choice okay well does it end here um, well no uh, we can actually exploit more um, let me rewrite what we have that is x squared minus x minus 2 is equal to 0 as such so again like I did here okay I have the same thing but now let me divide by x instead of applying a square root let's see what we get um, so I get an x that is x plus 2 over x or in other words x is 1 plus 2 over x and this is my g3 of x so here we have up to so far we've got three g's and each one takes a completely different form okay does it end here well no what else can we do um and i can do something really dirty <laughs> let's put it that way where you know i've got x squared minus x minus 2 is equal to zero i can go ahead and do something um from the ground up and what i mean by this is that I could say, oh, my x is something like x squared plus 2 over 2x minus 1. What? Now, one might be asking, what on earth did I do here? Well, <laughs> note that from here, you can go back up here. How? Just, you know, ex apply cross multiplication. You get x into 2x minus 1. That is x squared plus 2, which is 2x squared minus x equal to x squared plus 2. And then... You get your x squared over here, you get you get your 2 over here, and so you get 2x squared minus x squared minus x minus 2 equal to 0, which is x squared minus x minus 2 equal to 0. Back to the initial equation that we had over here, right? Let me erase all this. And so we agree that my g4 of x over here is this rational function x squared plus 2 over 2x minus 1 I can go ahead and you know get as many functions as you guys want but the idea here is to find a good function and what I mean good function is that it converges if it does now the reason we say if, if any convergence is that the following so um, let's pick g1 and see how this guy behaves so my g1 is x squared minus 2 right? and don't forget, I've got two roots over here. My roots are given up here. We just derive them. They're minus 1 and 2. So I've got two roots. Let me call it x0 star. It's minus 1 and x1 star. It, and let's focus on the positive root so far. So, so let's pick any initial point. Let's say x0, which is, I don't know, let's say 4. My initial guess is 4. And we'll see that not only is g important but also your initial guess so two things play a role here in the conversions it's your g and an initial guess so let's say i gave this initial guess x0 so plugging it in the equation my x1 is g1 of x0 is let me stop denoting g1 because it might lead to confusion so i'll just denote it as because there's a lot of subscripts over here so let's keep it simple as such so this guy is x0 squared minus 2, my initial guess is 4, so 4 squared minus 2, which is 16 minus 2, that is 14. So after one iteration, this is what I get. Let's do this again, x2 is g of x1, that is x1 squared minus 2, which is 14 squared minus 2, wow, which is something like, is 196, so 196 minus 2, that's 194. Doing this again, x3 is g of x2, 
that is x2 squared minus 2. You can see that it explodes. So 194 squared minus 2 is 194 squared. That's 37636. 3736. Whatever. Uh, minus 2. Something very, very, very big. This means that with this initial guess and this function, we just diverge. Note that here, this is characterized by the fixed point theorem. So being a bit mathematical over here, let's write down the fixed point theorem. So fixed point theorem states the following. Now I'm going to be rigorous over here as per the theorem, and then we'll just, you know, check what the theorem means. Okay. We'll see what, what you need to know to proceed. It states the following. Let G of X be a fixed point function so far so good so it's our g that we've been talking about and it should be continuous on a certain interval a and b so we check for continuity on the interval we're working with and let's say an initial point x0 falls within a b okay so you pick this point within a now suppose that the derivative g prime of x exists so this symbol means exists on a b b so not only is it continuous but its derivative is continuous hence it's differentiable on a b and now let k fall in zero one actually this should be an open interval so something like this zero one in other words k is between zero and one in a strict sense and so the theorem tells you the following. Given all those conditions, G is continuous on AB, G is differentiable on AB, thus G prime exists on AB, and there's a K that is strictly between zero and one. It tells G prime of X in absolute value is strictly less than K. Now here, uh, <laughs> what I usually check and what you're usually going to check is that, is, is that your K is actually, you take it, you know, you take it to the extreme limits and you say, okay, if G, you're not going to, you know, pick a K between zero and one and just, you know, check if G prime of X in absolute value is less than K. You're going to say, if you're going to check whether G prime of X is less than, strictly less than one for all X that lie in A, B. If this is valid, then guess what? For any guess you pick in A, B, you're guaranteed to converge to a unique fixed point in AB. Convergence is guaranteed. So we can go ahead and say for any x0 in AB, we have that xk plus 1, which is equal to g of xk, is guaranteed to converge to a p that lie within an AB. This is a super powerful tool stating that whenever you start with a point in AB, you will converge. Of course, given the assumptions, continuous on AB, differentiable on AB, and that G prime of any point within AB is less than, strictly less than one in absolute value. So right now, let's see how this applies to our Gs, the four Gs that we have, and let's just focus on the positive root two. Okay, so using the theorem, we need a certain interval a, b. So let's start with g1 of x, that is x squared minus 2. It's continuous everywhere, so no need to worry about continuity over here on an interval a, b. Let's check its derivative. g prime of x is 2x. Now 2x in absolute value, let's write 2x in absolute value, okay? So g prime of x in absolute value is 2x in absolute value. Now, any interval you're going to pick that contains your positive root 2, if 2 is found within AB, then it is impossible to guarantee g prime of x is strictly less than 1 for all x within AB where AB contains your 2. Because if g prime of x is less than 1, Let's work in, in for positive x's, so g prime of x less than 1. It's when in absolute value 2x is less than 1, x is less than half and positive, or x greater than minus half and negative. Only in those two cases 
do we have that g prime of x in absolute value is less than one only in those two cases but we don't care why because your root is not contained within don't forget your root two and even minus one both are not contained within those two intervals thus the fixed point theorem does not guarantee convergence so that's why we saw that for g1 of x we picked four at random the initial guess it's not going to work that's what this theorem is 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 telling us informally let's do the same thing for g2 of x so my g2 of x if i remember correctly square root of x plus two so let's compute the derivative g2 prime of x is the derivative of what this is a square root of a function so the derivative is a fraction and the numerator we have the derivative of what's within the square root so x plus 2 so the derivative is 1 then down here we have 2 square root of x plus 2 simple as that okay an absolute value is going to give me the same thing because the square root returns a positive quantity and the half is positive so this is positive now when is this strictly less than 1 Let's multiply by 2 on both sides. 1 over square root of x plus 2. So multiplying by 2 on both sides. Multiply by 2. We get this condition. If I apply the reciprocal, we get this, right? And now if I apply a square, I get this. And now if I do something like this guy is minus 1.75. So it's telling you for all x minus 1.75 till infinity we have that g prime of x in absolute value is less than one so you're free to pick any point within this interval you will converge so here convergence is certain because two lies within this interval okay good you can do the same thing for g3 uh what was g3 it was this guy right here g of x is one plus two over x Applying the derivative minus 2 over x square in absolute value. This guy is minus 2 over x square. x square is positive, 2 is positive. The minus thus vanishes. So it becomes 2 over x square. And um, one method over here, um, instead of you know looking for an interval, you can just check g prime of 2 really quick to check is it worth looking for an interval that makes sense because if this guy is less than one two is the root if g prime of two is less than one then most probably there is an interval around two that guarantees g prime of x in absolute values less than one for any x within that interval containing two okay so let's do g prime of two which is two over two square which is half less than one so yes we can find an interval where we can converge to two so here we can say that also convergence is certain according to the fixed point theorem. G4, let me call it G over here, which was this guy over here. So x squared plus 2 over 2x minus 1. x squared plus 2 over 2x minus 1. Let's get the derivative 2x into 2x minus 1 minus 2 into x plus 2 over 2x minus 1 all square. Over here, we get 4x square minus minus 2x square minus 4 over 2x minus 1 square. 2x square minus 2x plus 4 over 2x minus 1 square. That is 2 into x square minus x minus... I don't know why I'm factoring this. It doesn't make sense. So right here, let's test if g prime of 2 in absolute value is less than 1. Okay, so down here I get a 2 times 2, that is 4 minus 1, 3, 3 squared is 9. And up there I get 2 squared, that is 4 times 2, 8. 2 times 2, that's a 4, minus 4, that's an 8, that is 1 over 9. So yes we could find an interval and thus a starting point where this guy converges. Now let me show you how to do this really quick on MATLAB. Let's define number of iterations, let's say 20. And let's loop. It's not a good idea in MATLAB to do a loop, but I'm just showing you for demonstration's sake, right? Okay, so now let's pick an, X, an initial point, let's say zero, zero, right? And it would be awesome if we could, you know, because, you know, the derivative also has to be an absolute value less than 1 on the initial point. Huh? So for that, um, 
let's write down the derivatives we computed g1 let me call it dg1 which is the derivative g1 is the absolute value of x let's do the same thing dg2 so dg1 depends on the interval we didn't state any con guarantee ah a, a point that's important if the point if this is not less than one it does not mean that the algorithm or the method will not converge for use of g however if the point is less than one you're guaranteed to converge i'll show you in a bit when we plot so this is dg1 with the derivative of g1 and over here we're going to test if dg1 less than one display fixed point converges for x equal to this particular x and g1 of x combined else is not guaranteed i'm going to copy uh three more times one four three and four so dg2 dg3 and dg4 okay and right here those so for now i'm going to launch this function and check for x equal to zero who's going to so your x is equal to zero is guaranteed to converge g1 this is this contradicts what i said about the interval thing so if you choose your x between zero and half you're guaranteed to, to converge i'm going to correct what i said previously that you're not guaranteed to converge no matter what x you pick but However, if you pick your x within 0 and half, 0 and half and minus 0, right? You're guaranteed, guaranteed to converge. Okay, now let's apply the fixed point iteration. So right here, x is 0. I'm going to be redundant over here because I'm going to copy paste this, this block four times. I know it's not the most elegant way, but I just want to save the values and plot them. Okay. First of all, I'm going to save my values for G1 in a vector called F1. If n is x, and my next x is going to be my G1 of x, which was, actually, let me save those in anonymous functions better. Minus 1. Uh-huh. Okay. So my x, as such, and I save the value and so on. So all my values are saved within F1. As you can see, conversions. I'm going to do this three more times, each each time for e. So this guy is f2, g2. This guy is f3, g3. And this guy is f4, g4. Okay. And finally, let's plot on a figure. Hold on. Copy paste this three more times. Two, three, four. Each time in a different color. Magenta black and blue and each time we plot the different x values okay we see convergence except for this guy right here okay there's a problem for g4 um let me show you let me show you what i mean this guy should have been taken in the absolute value sense this is the absolute value of the derivative so i did a tiny mistake here i didn't introduce the absolute value i just introduced it over here I did the derivation of G prime, but then introduced it over here. Well, in MATLAB, you have to explicitly say the absolute. We didn't introduce it here because x squared is positive. And over here, because square root of x plus 2 is also positive. I introduced it here because x to x could be negative if x is negative. Likewise here, you could see that the third and fourth are not converged. However, we have one guy that is not converging. It's either G3 or G4. We're going to see that using a legend we're going to discriminate plots x let me copy paste this three more times two, three and four change the sub indices and let me add a plot here that shows me where my root is i'll do an x label and right here i'll say this is my, because this is the fifth plot a true root Oh yeah, I'm not done in my statement. So, so this is an X label, save X. And then actually my X label is iteration number. And 
and my Y label, I'll use X of N, if you will, or X of K, whatever you want. Grid on grid minor. Okay, so it's G4 that is not converging. Actually, it's converging to the negative root. How beautiful is that? It's converging to negative root. Okay, but it's to this one. Um, okay. Uh, okay. That's not not quite sure what this is over here. Okay, this is my F1. Oh, my F1, yes. That looks like this. Oh, those come from F2, which are giving me complex numbers, which is pretty weird. Okay, G2, G2 square root of X minus two. What X minus two? Let's go back up here. No, root of X plus two. My bad. So this guy is an x plus two. two. Okay, now this should be working properly, and there you go. You see that all my functions, g1, g2, and g3, even though g3 is not guaranteed to converge, it does. However, if it's guaranteed, we're sure that it converges, okay? Okay, so that's all I wanted to show you in this lecture, how fixed point iterations work, and what are the assumptions, what guarantees your conversions it's your derivative of the g function that you choose okay and your initial starting point if g prime at this starting point is less than one in absolute value you're guaranteed to converge and it's not you're not guaranteed but that does not mean it, it will not converge okay so thanks for watching if you have any questions whatsoever don't feel shy leave a leave your comment down in the comment section below and i'll make sure i'll get to it as soon as possible also let me know if you'd want any more um, numerical analysis or numerical me methods on my channel right and to support the channel to keep it going uh, don't forget to like the video subscribe to the channel and i'll see you then